This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to continue to learn to play Twilight Imperium, the third edition. Twilight Imperium, the third edition, is a game of galactic conquest for three to six players released by Fantasy Flight Games in 2005. The game was designed by Christian T. Peterson and takes about three to five hours to play. In the last episode, we learned about the game's lore as well as how to set up the game itself. So if you haven't seen that video, you might want to go back and give it a look. In this video, we're going to focus on the gameplay rules so you can start playing. First, however, I'm going to tell you a little story. Recently, I was in a game shop inquiring about an expansion for Twilight Imperium. The game shop clerk, bless him, was like, why are you interested in playing that dinosaur? It's way too complicated and takes forever to play. After reviewing the rules, I agree, it is a dinosaur, specifically a Stegosaurus. To be fair, the game does receive some criticism for its complexity. Twilight Imperium's mechanics can seem like a disjointed pile of old bones. However, when properly organized and arranged, the game does have a unique symmetry, and it can be very awe-inspiring in its sheer magnitude. Which is a poetic way of saying, it's not that difficult to understand. Allow me to demonstrate. Much like a Stegosaurus's brain, a game round begins small and simple in the strategy phase. During this phase, players choose 6 out of 8 strategy cards that will form the bulk of the game round. Now, no doubt the beating heart of this whole Twilight Imperium experience is the epic space battles and planetary invasions that take place in the action phase. However, as you resolve each player's conquests and they play their strategy card, this forms the plated backbone of the game's various mechanics. Each strategy card forms a defined sequence of narrative events that run down the spine to the spike tail at the end, which is the status phase. The status phase is the business end of the beast where objectives are translated into victory points or defeat. So as you can see, the game clerk is kind of right. It is a dinosaur. An awesome kind of kick ass and take names kind of dinosaur. And I assure you, it's definitely not that difficult to learn. Together, step by step, we'll assemble the bones of this great beast, and by the time it's over, you'll comprehend the entire animal. So with that said, let's get started. To learn Twilight Imperium's gameplay mechanics, it's important to first understand the game's various currencies and command systems. First, let's talk about the game's main currencies, which can be found in the economic area on each player's play area. Most of each race's economic power comes from the number of planet cards they hold. At the beginning of the game, however, each player only has the number of planets in their home system. In this example, the Mentec Coalition begin the game with their home planet, Mole Primus. Let's take a closer look and I'll show you how the planet cards work. For every system that a player controls, they receive one or more planet cards. Each planet card grants a player the two main currencies of the game, resources and influence. Resources are mainly used to purchase military units. Influence is used to vote on laws from political cards. When spending either of these currencies, you cannot use part of the currency available or bank the currency for the next round. When spending a planet's currency, whether it be resources or influence, it's all or nothing. Whenever a player uses either resources or influence, they turn the planet card face down. The planet is then considered exhausted for the remainder of the game round. At the end of the game round, the planet card will be flipped upright again. This is known as refreshing the planet. During the next round, the resources and influence of that planet will be available to use again. Now, there is also a third currency in the game, 
known as trade goods. Trade goods are primarily earned through trade agreements, which we'll cover off a little later in the tutorial. The value of trade goods is they can be used as either resources or influence. And they can be used to wheel and deal with other players in the forms of bribes and other considerations. Just remember when you spend your trade goods, they're gone. They do not refresh. You need to earn more through trade agreements. Trade goods are earned from active trade contracts in the economic area. When trade goods are received, they're placed in the upper right-hand corner of the race sheet. While we're on the race sheet, it's time to discuss the game's command system. Each player has a total of 16 command counters in the game. If you recall from the setup phase, we place two of those in strategy, four in fleet supply, and three in the command pool. That leaves seven command counters remaining in the reinforcement area. So let's take a closer look at how this system works. Command counters represent the collective resources of your race. Command counters are two-sided, the first side being the race's emblem and the second side being the silhouette of a ship. The purpose of the ship's silhouette is to keep the command counters from getting confused on the race sheet. Therefore, you will always use the ship's silhouette for the middle triangle labeled Fleet Supply. Command counters can be allocated into three areas on the race sheet. Strategy Allocation, Fleet Supply, and Command Pool. Counters in Strategy Allocation allow a player to enable the secondary ability on a strategy card when it's played. When the game begins, the Mintech Coalition only has two command counters in the Strategy Allocation area. Therefore, they can only activate up to two of the secondary abilities on the six strategy cards in play for that round. Fleet Supply represents the maximum number of ships that you can have in one fleet. The Mintac Coalition has four command counters in the Fleet Supply area. This means in each fleet in a system they can have a maximum of four ships. This does not count fighters. Counters in the Command Pool represent the number of systems that you can activate. When activating a system, you can move all ships to that system within range. Fleet supply allocations are locked in until the end of the game round. Command counter allocations to strategy and command can be spent throughout the game round. At the end of the game round, any spent command counters are returned to the reinforcement area. Now that you have an understanding of how the different currencies and the command system works in Twilight Imperium, we can move on to the next step. Now let's take a closer look at the phases of gameplay. In Twilight Imperium, a game round is divided into three phases. The strategy phase, the action phase, and the status phase. First, let's begin with the strategy phase. In the strategy phase, players will pick six out of the eight strategy cards that are available. Now the Mentech player has already been assigned the role of speaker. The remaining races are each going to choose one strategy card. Now, while a player may want to take a certain strategy, they got to bear in mind that the number on the strategy card establishes the order of play. Therefore, certain strategy cards that may be perceived as more powerful may place them later in the order of play. So let's begin with our tutorial example. The Hakan choose strategy number five, trade. The Letniv choose strategy number seven, technology. Soul chooses strategy number six, Warfare. The L1Z1X choose strategy number three, Political. 
Yasuriel choose strategy number four, logistics. Now the question becomes, what happens to the two remaining strategies? Strategy number two, diplomacy, and strategy number eight, imperial. Those two strategy cards will be left out of the upcoming gameplay sequence. However, at the end of the strategy phase, any remaining strategy cards get a bonus marker placed on them. These bonus markers remain on the strategy cards as incentives for the next strategy phase. If during the next strategy phase a player selects that strategy card with a bonus, they can then turn that bonus in for trade goods. The bonus is an extra incentive for players to choose that particular strategy so that they get the extra trade goods. Once this is complete, it's time to move on to the action phase. In the action phase, we're going to play through the established order of play that you see above on the strategy cards. So let's begin with the Mentac and see what other options they have during the action phase. Now let's move into the action phase. The action phase is divided into four parts. Strategic action, tactical actions, transfer actions, and the pass action. The first three actions can be played in any order. The tactical action and the transfer action cost one command counter. You can play these actions as many times as you like as long as you have the command counters to afford them. In each player's turn, the strategic action and the pass action are the only ones that are required. Next, we're going to walk through each action to give you an idea of how they work. Before we work our way through the strategy cards, let's first see how they're laid out. Now we already learned that the number on the strategy card refers to the order of play, and the title obviously tells you what the card's about. The upper half of the strategy card is for the primary ability, and it affects the active player. The lower half of the strategy card is for the secondary ability and is open to all other players. Once the strategy card has been played and the primary ability resolved, other players can typically use command counters from their strategy allocation area to take advantage of the secondary ability effects. Following the order of play after the active player, each player must choose whether they will spend a command counter or pass. Once each player has made their decision and taken their effect, the card is turned over and becomes inactive. Now, let's take a look at each strategy card and its effect on gameplay. The first strategy card is Initiative and establishes the active player as first in the order of play. This is the only strategy card without a secondary ability. This strategy card's primary ability grants the active player the speaker token. It also allows the player to activate any secondary abilities throughout the game round at no cost. The second strategy card is Diplomacy. This strategy card's primary ability allows the active player to initiate a ceasefire between himself and another player. In gameplay, this prohibits either side from activating the other's systems. For the strategy card's secondary ability, any player that chooses to pay one command counter from strategy can refresh two of their planet cards. Essentially, this allows a player to reuse two planet cards during a game round. The third strategy card is Political. The political strategy card is probably the most complicated. This strategy card grants the player three sequential abilities. First, the active player draws three action cards and receives one command counter from their reinforcement area. These they keep for themselves. Second, the active player draws one political card and proposes the new law to the Galactic Council for approval. Third, the active player then draws three more political cards and, keeping them secret, selects one to place on the top of the political deck 
and then places the remaining two on the bottom of the political deck. For this strategy card's secondary ability, any player that chooses to pay one command counter from strategy can draw one action card. Now let's pause for a moment and learn how galactic bills become law. As you may remember from the first tutorial, the political card deck is located in the laws section of the common play area. When new laws are ratified by the galactic council, place them face up in this area. First though, political cards presented as active bills must be voted on by the Galactic Council. Let's see how the galaxy's political process works. The political card deck contains 60 cards that represent bills that the Galactic Council must vote on. These bills can be divided into the following groups. 38 of the 60 cards are laws. Once a law is passed, it remains in force for the remainder of the game. There is only one card in the deck that can repeal a law once it's been passed. Therefore, you must be very careful with the laws you pass because you're going to be living with the majority of them throughout the game. Ten of the political cards are elections. In an election, a player or a particular planet can be voted on to receive the card's effect. This is one of my favorite cards, Public Execution. For his crimes against the Council, he must die. Let his death set an example. The Galactic Council elects a player, whether he did anything or not, and he suffers the consequences. The elected player loses all his action cards, his planets are exhausted, and his units receive negative one on all combat rolls for the remainder of this round and you thought diplomacy could be mean. On the lighter side of things, there are 12 cards that act as temporary statutes. These cards usually have an immediate effect and then are discarded. Now, maybe this is just because I'm an American, but let's take a closer look at the voting process. In this example, we're going to assemble a Galactic Council meeting to decide on whether to open the trade routes or not. Players that are for this bill agree that each player should receive two trade goods once this statute is passed. Players that are against this bill believe that this round, during the status phase, each player must give all their trade goods that they would normally receive to the player on their left. Each member of the Galactic Council has a minimum of one vote called influence. A player's total influence is derived from the number of face-up planet cards in their play space's economic area. Remember, if a planet has already used its resources or influence, it is placed face down and the influence cannot be utilized for the vote. Moving clockwise around the table, let's review each race's influence based on their starting homeworld. When voting begins, the player to the left of the nominated speaker goes first and continues around the table clockwise. The speaker is always the last player to vote. In this example, first the Hakan would place their vote. The Hakan may vote for, against, or abstain. The Hakan have three planets in their home system. However, one planet does not have influence. Therefore, the Hakan's total influence is 2. The Letnev have two planets in their home system, but only one has influence. Therefore, they have a total influence of 1. Sol has one planet in its system with two influence. The L1Z1X has one planet in its home system. Unfortunately, that planet has no influence. But every member of the Galactic Council has at least one influence to vote. The Yasuriel have two planets in their home system with a total influence of five. And finally the race with the speaker token, the Mentak, have one planet in their home system with a total influence of one. Now, since this is politics in the truest sense of the word, players can wheel and deal with each other using trade goods, promises, blatant lies, whatever is necessary to secure the outcome they're looking for. 
Let your imagination run wild for a moment while we transition to looking at action cards. The same strategy card also introduces action cards into the game. Action cards often bend rules and change gameplay to add spice to the experience. Just about every rule in the game has an action card that either changes the rule, subverts it, or augments it. The text at the bottom tells you when you can play the action card. When the card says you can play as an action, it means at any time. Here are some additional examples of action cards from the action card deck. Sabotage, Thugs, and one of my favorites, Public Disgrace. As you'll soon learn by playing the game, there's an action card for just about everything. Now, let's return to the game's strategy cards. The fourth strategy card is Logistics. This strategy card's primary ability allows the active player to receive four command counters from their reinforcement area. For this strategy card's secondary ability, any player that chooses to pay three influence can receive one command counter from their reinforcement area. The fifth strategy card is Trade. This strategy card's primary ability allows the active player two options. Option A, the active player immediately receives three trade goods and then receives any trade goods from their active trade agreements. Finally, the active player opens trade negotiations among all players. The active player has the sole power to approve or decline any new trade agreements. Option B, the active player cancels all trade agreements. Trade contracts are returned to their owners. For this card's secondary ability, any player that chooses to pay one command counter from strategy can receive trade goods from active trade agreements. Now let's pause for a moment and discuss trade agreements. Remember that your trade contracts and any executed trade agreements are kept in your economic area. Now let's see how the trade negotiation process works. Each player has two trade contracts that they can use to form trade agreements with other players. Each race may have a different amount of trade goods that they can offer with each trade contract. For example, the Mentac player only has two trade contracts that can offer one trade good each. The Hakan player has two trade contracts that offer three trade goods each. This is another example how certain races have an advantage over others in areas such as trade. When the game begins, all trade contracts are placed face down. When the trade strategy card is played and the active player opens trade negotiations, players can establish trade agreements with each other. The key rules to remember here is that one player cannot establish more than one trade agreement with the same player, and they can hold no more than two trade agreements. Also remember that all trade agreements must be approved by the player playing the trade strategy card. When all trade agreements are approved and executed, there should be enough for each player to have two. New trade agreements cannot be used to collect trade goods in the same round that they're approved. However, in the next round when the trade strategy card is played, you can collect trade goods then. Now that you understand how trade negotiations work, let's head back to our strategy card discussion. The sixth strategy card is Warfare. This strategy card's primary ability allows the active player to retrieve one command counter from the galaxy map and return it to their command pool. Essentially, this gives the active player the ability to reuse a tactical or transfer action during the round. For the Warfare Strategy Card's secondary ability, any player that chooses to pay one command counter from Strategy can choose one or two destroyers or carriers on the galaxy map 
and move them to an adjacent empty system. This ability excludes home systems though. Next, the player will place a command counter from their reinforcement area in each destination system. The seventh strategy card is Technology. This strategy card's primary ability allows the active player to choose one technology advance for which they have the required prerequisite technologies. For the strategy card's secondary ability, any player that chooses to pay one command counter from their strategy area and spend eight resources may choose one technology advance for which they have the required prerequisite technologies. Now, let's pause for a moment and talk about technology. Now, let's talk about the most complicated item in Twilight Imperium, the dreaded technology tree. The technology tree looks like a giant circuit board in the rulebook. Veteran Twilight Imperium players are experts at navigating this thing. For new players, however, I'm going to recommend the following simple system. First, the basics. There are four types of technology. Warfare, biotechnology, propulsion, and general technology. When reviewing the technology benefits, these groups can be further organized into three groups. Technologies that affect the fleet, technologies that impact planetary units, and technologies that affect the player. Rather than figuring out how to game the technology tree, I recommend just focusing on technologies that complement your playstyle. If you're obsessed with outfitting your ships with the latest and greatest, then study fleet technologies. If you feel your ground forces are undergunned, research planetary technologies. And if you're interested in maximizing your player tactics, choose player technologies. Once you're more familiar with the game, then you can optimize your choices on the tree. These are the six upgrades for warfare technology. Warfare technology has four fleet upgrades and two planetary upgrades. On each of these panes I've arranged the technology type, the name of the technology, and its effect, and then the dependencies. The dependencies are all the other technology cards you need to be able to get this technology. I've arranged these panes so the farther to the right you go, the more dependencies are required. Next are the six upgrades for General Technology. General Technology has five planetary upgrades and one player upgrade. Now you'll notice that some technologies, like Micro Technology, has OR statements. This reflects that there are multiple ways to navigate to this technology on the Technology Tree. And, at the furthest to the right, you can see technologies like Integrated Economy begin to get very complicated with the requirements. Now, let's look at the six upgrades for Propulsion Technology. Propulsion Technology has five fleet upgrades and one player upgrade. As you can see, several of the technologies on the Propulsion Tech sheet are focused around extending the range of your ships. And finally, let's review the upgrades for Biotechnology. Biotechnology has three fleet upgrades, two planetary upgrades, and one player upgrade. Biotechnology is interesting because it affects several aspects of the gameplay, but as you can see, you really need to tap into a lot of other technologies to make use of them. Biotechnology doesn't have an early linear path like some of the other technologies do. And with that, we've completed looking at all the technologies in the Twilight Imperium core game. Now, back to our strategy cards. The eighth strategy card is Imperial. This strategy card's primary ability requires the active player to draw the next objective card and place it face up in the common play area as an active objective. Please note, if the objective card named Imperium Rex is drawn, then the game immediately ends. 
Following the placement of the new objective, the active player then receives two victory points. With this card's secondary ability, any player that chooses to pay one command counter from strategy can immediately build units from a system that contains a friendly space dock. Please note you can use this ability even if you've activated the system already, and building units here does not activate the system. And with that, we've run through all eight of the strategy cards in the core game. It's been a while, but now we're back to our action phase screen. And this is a good place to break until our next episode. In the next episode, we'll complete the action phase discussing the tactical action and the transfer action. And we'll finish up the game by covering off on the status phase, where we'll prepare the game for the next round of play and learn how objectives are translated into victory points. The next episode will cover everyone's favorite topic, Planetary Conquest. And we'll look at some of the game's alternate play modes, such as Distant Suns and the Leader Units. So, until next time, I'm Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode.